Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Neil Giuliano, CEO of the San Francisco AIDS Foundation. Neil was previously president of GLAD, the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation, and he was the youngest as well as the first openly gay mayor of Tempe, Arizona, which earned a coveted All-American City Award under his leadership. Since 1982, the San Francisco AIDS Foundation has been working to radically reduce the number of new HIV infections and to ensure all San Franciscans know their HIV stat status and get proper care. Neil has generously agreed to share some of his experiences with us, and I'd like to thank you, Neil, for joining us today. Thank you. My pleasure. So the AIDS epidemic, the AIDS pandemic, has gone through a number of different stages yes. since it, it really emerged in the late 70s, early 80s, particularly mm -hmm. in the early 80s. Uh, could you describe the trajectory of the pandemic and where it is today, and in particular, its emergence from an unknown condition, mm -hmm. um, the, the naming of the condition, all the way through a situation right now where uh, people living in poverty throughout Africa are struggling um, in, in such a way that, that whole, the whole subcontinent is, is being affected. Right. Um, well, that's a question that would take about an hour. Okay. Um, but let me kind of put it in pieces and, and go back to the very beginning. Um, when it was an unknown virus and literally people didn't know what was going on, they didn't know um, how it was transmitted, they didn't know how people were going to react to the virus in those very early days. And so people were very afraid. People weren't sure so much about the next week, no less, no less the next year, in, in future years. Um, and you know, society really had to come to terms with what, what is this thing? And because it, in the United States, first predominantly affected gay men, um, we had a society and a government really that quite honestly turned the other way and didn't look at it and didn't take it really seriously. And I think we should always remember the fact that people struggled when they didn't necessarily have to struggle as much because people looked the other way because of the, the community that was disproportionately affected in those early days. San Francisco, of course, was the first city in the United States that reached epidemic levels uh, of the virus and of AIDS. And so the result of that, uh, the San Francisco AIDS Foundation now was created almost 30 years ago, it'll be 30 years in 2012, uh, came together uh, at 520 Castro Street because some people were uh, wondering how are we going to take care of each other and what do we do? So they formed the foundation, other organizations were formed, and then you saw over time um, the education came about, the knowledge came about, and it, it changed, it changed society's look. It changed certainly in San Francisco where people really came together in a very strong way. Um, worked with then Mayor Feinstein, you know, to really, at one point, the city of San Francisco was spending more on fighting HIV and AIDS than the entire United States, all the other cities combined. Uh, so they, and they had to, because this is where it really took hold, you know, so strongly in the very beginning. Um, then, you know, it was really, it was crisis. It was dealing with a crisis and a crisis intervention model of, of of care and taking care of each other, and and, and slowly over time, uh, with the you know the beginning of some of the medications and the antiretroviral drugs and so forth, uh, that began to slow down the progression and began to slow down the new infection rates. Um, we still, though, in San Francisco, have two new infections a day in this city, and that's too many, which is why our organization has set a goal to reduce that number in half by 2015, and that means getting right out in the middle of where the drivers of the new infections are. We can talk about that later. But I think what you've seen now is we've evolved from that crisis intervention mode, no knowledge at all, to now we have the knowledge and we know how the disease is transmitted. We know how the virus is, is transmitted. Um, we know what we can do to intervene. We know some prevention methods that work. But quite honestly, if we had the right prevention methods, we wouldn't have new infections. So we know that one single message is not the message, and that we have to be looking for new opportunities and new interventions all the time. But we have progressed now with the new medications to where we have a manageable um, disease. When people are infected with HIV and, and move through, um, through the stages of that, they actually have a manageable disease that they can take care of. Um, but we also have to be careful to, especially with the younger cohort, um, to help them understand that just because this is now a manageable disease uh, that is treatable from the standpoint of uh, some of the drugs that, that are out there, it's treatable, there is no cure, but it is treatable, um, that doesn't mean you want to get it. And it doesn't mean that it's not right. very it, deadly serious. It's very deadly serious. Uh, it's significant uh, compromise of, of your health 
uh, for the long haul. And so uh, just because it's a manageable disease now does not mean our work is over with regard to prevention. In fact, we really need to step it up quite a bit. As people's awareness shift and as the medical technology shifts, now the the, the situation on the ground has, has shifted considerably. And there's, and there's been uh, significant opportunities for public education over the years. If you just look at that trajectory, you look at Ryan White, right? look at Greg Luganis. You look well, at, well describe, describe Ryan White and describe Greg. Well, here, here's, here's a, a young child who, uh, through transfusion, right. um, contracted HIV. And his own community in Indiana wouldn't let him swim in the local pool. And, uh, and of course, that was just you know outrageous. And uh, literally, the globe came to his defense, uh, from the from the big celebrities to an outpouring of, of support. And that was a, a, um, a educational moment for everyone about HIV. And and indeed, that's why we have the Ryan White Care Act today because it was so significant an opportunity to transform people's understanding of what HIV really was. And describe the Ryan White Care Act, because it, it, it moves from, from complete fear and ignorance. Yeah, to, to providing support, um, community support, federal funding for uh, one of the largest Ryan White programs uh, involves uh, support for people who can't afford all their medications. Right. Uh, and of course, we know that people need to stay on their medications. When they're on their medications, their viral load is lower. When their viral load is lower, the rate of new transmission, of course, is going to be uh, lower as well. Uh, so it's, it's very, very significant, and the Ryan White Care Act will be coming up for reauthorization again in 2013. Now what's interesting is it, it does have to shift a little bit. The Ryan White Care Act that was needed in the very beginning is not the same focus and so forth that the, the re reauthorization of Ryan White will probably need to be in 2013. So there's a collection of folks from around the country uh, and in the public policy arena in the health area who will be looking at exactly what does the Ryan White Care Act need to evolve to for, for today. There's also been a dialogue with the pharmaceutical uh, companies, of which course. is yeah. very meaningful. And, and in many respects, the dialogue that was um, th that was uh, taken up during the the depths of the AIDS crisis mm -hmm. now informs uh, much of the discussion uh, with pharmaceuticals when it comes to uh, orphan diseases. Sure. Um, the the expense of developing these drugs um, is is being mitigated in the cost of the drugs. Mm -hmm. Um, and very often following the model that was mm -hmm. uh, yeah. that was uh, initiated yeah. through <clears throat> through the community. Yeah. Um, so we've we've had those those opportunities for to, for the, the broader community to learn, and of course I think just about everyone remembers Magic Johnson. Yes. Uh, you know that was in 1991, I believe, um, when Magic announced that he was HIV positive. He was going to be retiring, and and of course he spent you know, the last 20 years doing a lot of public education and community education about HIV. Uh, so that's been extreme. So you've had those opportunities, but yet here we are still in, in 2011, I'll be honest with you, stigma is still a very big issue. Uh, you know, even with, you know, a Magic Johnson and a Greg Luganis and others who've been very open about their, their status and so forth, we still, have, um, we still have an issue that has, carries a lot of stigma. And so one of the things we work on is how do we reduce that stigma? And we reduce that stigma by being open about it, talking about it, by having those conversations. And the purpose for reducing that stigma is so that you can deal with the problem. Right. You can proactively talk about the problem. You can proactively prevent that problem from spreading. You can right. deal with vectors of transmission. Describe. Sure. Des and we actually we know that there are, there are for because we, we talk to clients and, and folks that um, you know, they put off getting tested because of the stigma if right. they find out they are positive. I had a situation just with a, uh, a close friend of mine in, in Arizona recently who um, had had some challenges, had had some substance use issues, uh, came out of that, is in recovery, and really had not been tested because he pretty much feared the outcome. Um, and sure enough, when he finally did get tested, he was positive, and he's now in care, but it took getting over that uh, stigma, the fact that what would people think? Um, if they knew I was HIV positive. And so it's really, really important that we do all we can to reduce that. That's why the community education efforts that we have, AIDS Walk, which is coming up here in, in July here in San Francisco, and we'll have 20,000 people walking through Golden Gate Park. That's extremely important as an awareness issue. The AIDS Life Cycle event that takes place from San Francisco to Los Angeles garners you know, huge publicity literally around the globe when the that happens. The bicycle. The bicycle, yeah, the bicycle uh, ride right, because right. it's the largest fundraiser for HIV AIDS on the planet uh, that raised $13 million this year. So all of those things help people understand that uh, you can be open about your status, you should be tested, 
And that's one of the cornerstones of one of the three legs of our stool of, of prevention and work right now is have everyone know their status, get people into care, and reduce new infections by 50%. Talk about how AIDS today um, is still spreading, um, if you can, and among the various communities, if mm -hmm. you can break that down for us. Um, well, the only, the only cohort for which the new infection rate is rising is gay and bisexual men. And what we know is that a lot of those, uh, especially in the urban centers, are African American. Um, so that's pretty much, it's almost like you know, we've kind of gotten back to where we were 30 years ago at the beginning of the disease. It's predominantly impacting this, this community. Not that there are not new infections uh, in all the other cohorts, uh, young African American women, um, straight women and so forth, intravenous drug users, those are still happening, but the prevalence rate has pretty much leveled off, whereas the prevalence rate among gay bisexual men uh, is still on the rise. Uh, in terms of your programs, describe describe how your programs work because you do have different. Uh, you have a you have a huge volunteer uh, mm -hmm. cadre, and then you have a, a, a range of different programs to deal with with different issues that, right. that people confront. Yes, so we have uh, probably one of the one of the most visible things that we do is the clinic in the Castro, uh, and that's called Magnet. It's been a part of the AIDS Foundation now since 2007. It was founded in 2003 then joined the foundation in 2007. And, and this year, we'll do probably close to 9,500 HIV tests, uh, another 10,000 uh, tests for other, uh, what we call STIs, sexually mm -hmm. transmitted infections. Um, but it's also a community center. There's a little art gallery in there. There's cultural exchange events that take place on there in, in, within Magnet. And so it really has become a health and wellness center um, for the broader LGBT community, uh, primarily gay and bisexual men in, in the Castro. Um, very visible, it has a really strong presence and, and overwhelmingly used. You go every morning that it is open, there is a line outside of the door is waiting this, for people to come in to be tested. Is this part of your uh, attempt to combat the stigma or the it's, bad it's, feeling? It's both the stigma, but it's also prevention because testing is a very, very important part of prevention. People need to know their status. When they know their status, we can move toward uh, preventing new infections. So magnet's a big part. Um, and then we have about 900 people in San Francisco that are involved with our Stonewall program, which is a program that deals with people who are dealing with substances, mm -hmm. um, either trying to get into recovery or slowly realizing they need to get into recovery or maybe not necessarily moving toward recovery, but knowing that they are um, engaging in high-risk behaviors. And so, you know, we know that substance abuse and substance use is a driver of new infections. And so we work very hard with those different pockets within that community uh, to have those relationships to keep them healthy and making good so decisions. So by focusing on, dr on drug use um, and by, um, by encouraging people to also deal with that part of the problem, it's a big help. also. Yes. And then we have a very successful, probably one of the most successful in the United States, uh, program for intravenous drug users, and that's the needle exchange program, which we now call syringe access services. It's the new government term for needle exchange. Um, but it's basically providing uh, clean needles to people, um, which has lowered the spread of new infections in San Francisco by less than 1%. At, at one point, the needle exchange program was incredibly Very controversial. Uh, controversial. Yes. It, it, it seems to have, the controversy seems to have lessened because it's worked. Well, the evidence so well is there, in, in, right. In practice. And it's not that, not, that's not that we're all saying, you know, intravenous drug use is okay. What we're saying is that it works to uh, prevent new infections of HIV. So intravenous drug use is not okay, and you have programs that try to help people to get off of the various yeah, drugs. Well, but one of the things that we know is that if we, if we can create a relationship with intravenous drug users by virtue of providing clean needles, clean syringes, uh, then we have the opportunity to talk to them about recovery programs if they're interested in recovery programs. Um, we, don't, uh, you know, we don't really go hard hardcore on that necessarily because our focus is on uh, lowering the new infection rate for with regard to HIV. So are you treating addiction as a continuum in terms of the entire AIDS Our, situation? So people enter perhaps right. to get needles because they have this condition, this, mm -hmm. this addiction, which also results in, yeah. a, and, then, and then you help them to go through perhaps sure. recovery processes and. Our philosophy is very much one of harm reduction. Okay. So we know what we try to do is get people to cause less harm to themselves and certainly to others. And we work through that model, you know, with our case management, with our counselors, uh, with the individuals that we come in contact with. 
In terms of, of the actual organization, could you describe the, the extent of the organization? You've already described sure. your volunteers. Um, talk about your, your full-time staff and also your relationship with other organizations in mm -hmm. San Francisco sure. and then nationally. Well, we've grown and we are now about 110 to 115 employees. Uh, our annual budget for the current year is about $23 million a year. About 70% of that revenue will come unrestricted from private sources individuals, corporations, foundations, um, and then through all of our third-party folks who are doing rides and walks and, and other events for us. Um, and, and then about 30% of the funds come to, uh, from government, government at all levels, but most flowing through uh, San Francisco Department of Public Health, where we now, have a, a very strong partnership. Now, are these unrestricted grants, or do, is this is the, the government the funds? Of... No. The government funds okay. are tied very specifically to the work that we do. So there's work for, in the gay bisexual community, there's work in the African American community, there's work with uh, the intravenous, the IDU community, intravenous drug user community with syringe access services. So government funds are very, very specific and very focused. And, and you have to report back on the kinds oh, sure. of services that you provide. So yeah. instead of investing in, in a larger government bureaucracy, what's, what's happening is that funds are being transmitted for yes. specific services that you provide? Right, and then what we do, we will, we will be the holder of those funds and the distributor of, of those funds, both internally with our organizations for our programs, but then we also partner with a lot of smaller organizations in town uh, to get right into the heart of the community where we need to be spending those funds and, and having those interventions. And the return on investment for San Francisco is what? Well, we've seen a great decline in the number of new infections, and we now have, I think, a a very flat uh, endemic situation of HIV AIDS in San Francisco. Um, <clears throat> so the growth rate is pretty, pretty much flattened out. But from our perspective, two new infections a day is still too, too many in San Francisco. And so we're going to be going into the communities and talking about those drivers of new infection and, and doing everything we can to reduce that rate. So disease costs money. Sure. So we save and money. And we you're, treat it. You're, you're basically... And with prevention. Talk about well, the, the place of the, of the San Francisco AIDS Foundation nationally and internationally. Well, certainly it's a significant voice of great influence because of the longevity of, the, of how San Francisco has had to deal with the epidemic from the very, very beginning. Um, and the fact that San Francisco AIDS Foundation has been there pretty much from the very beginning. Um, and as I mentioned, this is the first city where there was an epidemic level of, of the disease. So we're very engaged in the national policy area. Uh, the president, President Obama's national AIDS strategy, really came from a few individuals around the country, uh, a couple of which are here in San Francisco at the mm -hmm. San Francisco AIDS Foundation and some others around the country as well, helped form the basis for what is now the national AIDS strategy um, in partnership you know, with people within the administration. So significant influence and significant voice at the table with regard to how to deal with HIV and AIDS in this country. Um, and then we also are in, involved just sort of in the national network of sharing and receiving information about what works and what doesn't work. Quite honestly, San Francisco is quite often the laboratory where we're trying new things, we're seeing what's going to work, and then it gets replicated at other places around the country and literally other places around the world. In terms of, of your involvement, at one point um, uh, the San Francisco AIDS Foundation also had... There was right. an international organization that was formed uh, at San Francisco AIDS Foundation called Pangea. Right. Um, the foundation gave birth to this. It was, it's quite, a, quite an impressive group. Um, grew it, and it grew up to where now it's on its own. It's a totally separate 501c3 nonprofit organization. They actually are located in Oakland now and doing great work on a global scale and global with global influence, whereas San Francisco AIDS Foundation really has, has really drawn the circle back around San Francisco. And how do we focus in San Francisco to get those remaining new infections lower. So in many respects, you're taking the same kind of decisions that businesses take when they spin off sure. operations that they, that they, um, th they deem as non-core to their mission. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and you've set up a, a, a separate right. organization with separate funding streams. That's right. And they've do, they're doing very well. They've grown. They have their own funding streams now. And they're able to play in that global world of HIV and AIDS while we are concentrating on what's happening around the corner. What is the future for the San Francisco AIDS Foundation? Well, I think it's very strong. We have a very solid relationship with our, our government partner here in San Francisco um, to deliver services and programs to work on the, the, the situation and the, the spread of, the, of HIV AIDS in San Francisco. Um, we have great volunteers and great relationships. When you think of the, the, 
literally thousands of people who are out there raising funds for the programming and for the work that we do every day, either through the walk, through the ride, through Seismic Challenge. There's the Santa Skivvies Run. There's the Big Gay 10K. Uh, you name it, we have something for someone <laughs> in San Francisco to be involved with, uh, which is really nice because uh, people are going to want to choose the way that they want to be involved and the way that they can be involved. Not everyone's going to want to ride a bicycle from San Francisco to Los Angeles, but they can walk around Golden Gate Park or they can run a little bit through the Castro in their skivvies and, and pretend they're Santa Claus. There's lots of fun things for people to do, all to raise awareness and all to help people understand that um, you know, we have, we've done so well in the fight against HIV AIDS, but we have not won it. There is not a cure, and so we still need to be doing more. Well, no, Juliana, thank you so much thank for you. sharing your experience with us, and thank you for your insights. My pleasure. Thank you, Mark.